Hello, my name is Harold Halfdane and welcome to Archaeological Minecraft. I'm a former archaeologist who enjoys playing Minecraft and I thought it would be fun to combine the two. In today's episode, we'll be talking about bog trackways. One of the things I find annoying in Minecraft is trying to travel through swamp biomes. Now don't get me wrong, I like swamp biomes. I like the lily pads, the frogs are excellent, and I especially like those little blue orchids. However, when traveling through a swamp biome, you're always having to swap between hopping in and out of boats, wading through shallow water, and you can't use a horse very easily to speed up travel. Now of course, all this becomes a moot point in Minecraft once you get an elytra and can fly wherever you want. But if you don't have one of those, or it's early game, popping in and out of boats as you navigate through the area, or simply navigating completely around the biome, are really your only choices. It was much the same way for historic and prehistoric peoples when it came to bogs. Bogs are called by a couple of names, such as fens, moors, marshes, wetlands, and are even called a quagmire, which makes my point perfectly regarding the difficulty in crossing them. But, in the past, these areas are often considered impassable and dangerous regions. They're an area of mystery, ritual, and even refuge. An example of when it was used for refuge was early in Alfred the Great's reign in 878 AD on the Christian holiday of Epiphany. A Viking army under the command of Guthrum made a surprise attack on Alfred and his court at Chippendham, catching them completely off guard. With his court scattered, Alfred fled into the marshes around Athelney in the Somerset Levels where he could recoup his strength and recover while waging a guerrilla war against Guthrum. He eventually gained enough support from his nobles and he was able to gain back his kingdom at the Battle of Eddingham and drove off the Viking invaders, forcing Guthrum to convert to Christianity as a term of surrender. Now that was an example of when this type of landscape was used for refuge, but as I mentioned, it's also been a place of ritual. During the Mesolithic, Bronze, and Iron Ages, it was a place where individuals were sacrificed in ceremonial and ritual ways. Many of you are probably familiar with the various bog bodies that have been found in bogs, moors, and fens, or at least maybe have seen pictures of some of the more famous of the bog bodies, such as the Tullin or Lindau Man. What you might not know, however, is that sometimes these bodies show signs of being ritually killed. An example of this is with the wording men who were found in the Netherlands whose entrails were partially taken and drawn out by way of incision in their abdomen. Practicing augury, which is when you attempt to tell the future by looking at an animal's entrails, is something the Roman writer Strabo recorded the Celts would practice on human entrails. Other bog bodies such as the Tullin Man, found in Denmark, and the Yid Girl, found in the Netherlands, and the Lindau Man, found in northwest England, show evidence of being thrice killed. This form of overkilling is where the victim, probably killed in some sort of human sacrifice, was killed in a way that the body was found with a rope tied around their neck, indicating they were strangled or hanged, stabbed or had their throat slit, and hit on the head with an object such as an axe, thus killed in three different ways, or thrice killed. Bogs lend themselves to an otherworldly and unnatural feel, but at the same time are a timeless beauty. I can speak for this from first-hand experience for when I was doing a bit of archaeology in Ireland. I was on a dig on Ackle Island off the coast of County Mayo, excavating a medieval village located halfway up Mount Sleevemore. While there, we made a number of excursions through the bogs over the course of that excavation season. Each time I was left impressed by the stunning and iconic beauty of the place, but there was always an edge of danger, both real and metaphysical, that would creep in along the edges of my thoughts. Bogs, simply put, are an inherently dangerous environment. This comes from the very nature of how they're formed. If you look at this 2D model of a bog, you can see where there's a body of water, like a small lake, that's surrounded by moss and decaying plant material. This moss is a special type of plant called sphagnum moss or peat moss. This moss has the ability to retain water up to 16 to 26 times its own weight compared to its dry weight. 
as the moss grows, it starts creeping over the top of the lake's surface with any decaying plant material falling to the bottom of the lake. As this continues to happen over time, the whole of the surface can become covered and the whole lake filled in. While stages of a bog's creation are easy to see in a 2D side view, when you're walking through a bog and see little lakes dotted everywhere and the near treeless landscape of the peat moss as far as the eye can see, it's nearly impossible to pick up any clues regarding the bog's stage of formation. It's difficult to keep track of where you are or what direction you're going. Even in modern days, where everyone has a cell phone, GPS, and mapping app in your pocket, each year people get lost, wander off, and sometimes die in bogs. One of the dangers we were on the watch for during our archaeological surveys in the bogs was something called quaking bog. If you look back at the 2D side view diagram of a bog, you can see that what can happen over time is that as the bog continues to grow over the surface of the lake, there is naturally water underneath the moss. When walking across a bog, you can unknowingly walk out over the top of the lake and the ground beneath you and your feet start shifting and moving as your weight pushes into the moss of the, of the, and into the water. If you fall through the moss into the lake, it can be just as hard to gain purchase on anything solid and pull yourself out as it would on an icy lake if you were to fall through the ice. Another thing we were on the watch out for is the changing landscape within the bog. Since moss is able to float on top of the water, it's possible it might identify a bit of the landscape to navigate from, only to have the wind shift and push what unbeknownst to you is a floating bit of moss onto another area of the water, thus causing a disorientation effect, where you can't quite tell where the landscape was. Another bit of changing landscape in a bog is the fog and mist that, at least where I was in Ireland, could pop up out of the blue and with little notice. This fog could be so thick that you could hardly see the hand in front of your face, making transversing the bog impossible. Incidentally, if you're ever in that situation, your best bet is to settle down, not move, and wait for the fog to lift. If you don't, imagine what that'd be like, stumbling through a bog with little or no visibility, where it's hard to keep one's bearings when you can see where you're going, only to accidentally walk into some quaking bog where the ground itself becomes unstable and is apt to swallow you up. The last danger in a bog, which thankfully is rare, is a bog slide. This happens when there's too much water for the moss to hold and the ground liquefies and finds a new level. Think of an avalanche of snow in the mountains, but instead of snow, this happens with the moss, earth, and water in the bog. In 2008, in County Kerry, Ireland, an area of 4 kilometers or 2.5 miles experienced a bog slide which engulfed two bridges and led to a closed roads and left 30,000 people without a water supply. In some areas, the peat traveled 3 kilometers or 2 miles and was around 3 meters or 8 to 10 feet deep. So, I said this video was going to be about timber trackways. And so I suppose now that I've set up the context around bogs and how they work, I should talk about how ancient and historic peoples overcame and navigated these difficult terrains. There are a couple of different timber trackways I'm going to highlight in this video, and I'm going to replicate a section of each to give you a flavor of what they might look like in Minecraft. The first is the Sweet Track, named after Ray Sweet, who originally found the trackway which was built in the Somerset Levels in England. The Somerset Levels, if you recall from earlier in the video, is where Alfred the Great hid from Guthrum. However, the Sweet Track dates to thousands of years before the time of Alfred to 3807 BC. The Sweet Track was constructed by driving cross-shaped stakes, which look like an X into the peat about every 3 meters or 10 feet along the trackway. The X-shaped stakes crossed over a base rail, which was around 6 meters or 20 feet long and 7.6 centimeters or 3 inches in diameter. 
This base rail was laid on top of the peat surface. Higher up on the X shape, an oak plank was attached to the structure. These oaken planks were 40 centimeters or about 16 inches wide, three meters or about 10 feet long, and around five centimeters or two inches thick. Sometimes there needed to be a second plank placed over the first to match the level of the walking platform. The trackway connected a group of mounds and prehistoric lake dwellings that seemed to serve the purpose of providing easier travel between settlements within the bog. In total, the trackway ran for 1,800 meters or 1.2 miles. It seemed to have been only used for around 10 years, where it seems that rising water levels meant that it couldn't be used for any longer after that 10 years. Another timber trackway, this time found in Ireland, is the Corlea Trackway, which was constructed around 148 to 147 BC. This trackway was constructed a bit differently than described above with the Sweet Trackway. It was built of woven hurdles placed over brushwood, which was laid on top of the bog surface. Birch rails were placed around 1.2 meters or 4 feet apart, and oak planks 3 to 3.5 3 meters or 10 to 12 feet long and 15 centimeters or 5 inches thick were placed over the wooden rails and pegged into place to keep the planks from moving around. Running about one kilometer or 0.6 miles, it ended on a small island in the bog and connected to another trackway that ran another kilometer to dry land on the far side of the bog. As such, it's been suggested that it wasn't so much that the trackway allowed for access across the bog, but rather allowed for easier access into the bog, with the small island being the destination, perhaps for ritual purposes. Also, like the Sweet Trackway, the Carlia Trackway was built within a single year, but within a decade was unusable. In the case of the Carlia Trackway, it wasn't covered by water, it was covered over by the bog itself as the bog grew and developed. I mentioned previously that the Sweet Trackway dates to 3807 BC, and the Carlia Trackway dates to 148 to 147 BC. I know what you're thinking. Those are very specific dates for something that was built 5,000 and 2,000 years ago, and indeed, you are correct. We know that from using dendrochronology or tree ring dating on the wood the trackway was built from. If you want to know more about dendrochronology, I have another video all about different dating techniques on my channel. Different bogs preserve organic material differently. Raised bogs, for example, are good at preserving corpses and soft tissue, and fens are good at preserving skeletal remains, rather than soft tissue. Timber trackways and other items made from wood are preserved due to the extremely low oxygen conditions in bogs preserving the wood from decay like they normally would. The timbers also take on a black color as the acidic conditions in the peat and iron salts react to the tannins in the wood. Well, I hope you found our little trip down the proverbial bog trackway fun and interesting. Eh? You see what I did there? And maybe it's given you some ideas for what you can build in your own Minecraft world when needing to transverse and build paths through your own swamp biomes. If you enjoyed this video, please take the time to give it a like and a subscribe and leave a comment about what you enjoyed or what I can improve in these videos. Thanks and have a good rest of your day. Bye for now.